But let's talk now to Rachel Eng, who is the assistant curator at the National Museum of Singapore, and Jaya Aradurai, sorry, Ayadurai, the director of the Singapore History Consultants. Uh, a fantastic new exhibition at the National Museum entitled Dislocations, Memory and Meaning of the Fall of Singapore in 1942. Uh, good morning. Welcome to you both on Money FM. Good morning, Glenn and Neil. A pleasure to be back again. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Let's let, let's start with Rachel first. Let's set the scene. I have been to your exhibition. It is truly extraordinary, maybe for the benefit of our listeners and viewers. And by the way, Rachel, I must add, we've had some very positive comments already from our mm. listeners about your exhibition. Give us an overview about dislocations, memory and meaning of the fall of Singapore in 1942. That's great to hear. Um, this locations is the National Museum's effort at commemorating the 80th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. But um, we didn't just want to do like uh, a recap of you know what has happened uh, during the fall of Singapore, but we also understand the way that the war has continued to impact uh, generations. I think you had Louise on just before this, so we can mm. see like the way that the memory has transmitted through generations and through families. And we wanted to pick up on that, and especially because it's been 80 years how have 80 years impacted this transmission and change in the way that we think about the fall of Singapore and what it means to people. So that's sort of the angle that we're coming from. So although we use the what happens as a narrative to hold the exhibition together, we're also examining all of these events from very different perspectives, uh, both in terms of the people who were there as well as the people who came after that. And uh, Jaya, Jaya Aya Durai, the director of Singapore History Consultants, you've been on the show before talking to us. You are one of the foremost historians in Singapore about those war years. And what stands out to you? Is there a top line uh, importance uh, to the fall of Singapore be beyond the obvious one? Uh, but what, what, did that, what did that signal in terms of your looking back on Sing Singapore history? Well, as a Singaporean, for me, um, the war still has ramifications for the current state of affairs in so many ways. There is a contemporary relevance to the past. And so much of Singapore has been shaped uh, by what happened during the war. I mean, you just have to talk to your average national serviceman. Why is he doing national service? It was because of the fact that we suffered three and a half years of uh, a very unpleasant occupation, to put it mildly. Yeah. And um, and that's shaped how the way Singapore is. Singapore is one of the most militarized countries in the world. Every month, we have the air raid siren being played out with innocuous chimes. Uh, we have more than 350,000 men ready to go to war in six hours if necessary. It has shaped the way we see the region and the world, that we never want to be occupied again. So there are so many things that still speak to us. It has an impact in terms of overall security. It has an impact in the way history is taught in Singapore schools and the way people look back and view the war and what happened uh, in that period. I mean, there's so much to talk about. And I'm so grateful that uh, you gentlemen are actually covering the 80th anniversary. It's such an important anniversary. And as you said, an extraordinary generation. So much yeah. sacrifice was made in that period. Well, that, that's a key point, isn't it? And both Glenn and I are very much aware of our skin color and our heritage and our background. And I think sometimes the Western narrative has tended to dominate the 80th anniversary. We spoke to the wonderful Louise and we talk about the soldiers and the occupation and the, 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 you know, the prisoners of war who are often Westerners or Australians and Kiwis. And what I love, and this is a question to both of you, but Rachel first, what I love about your exhibition, Rachel, is the focus on the local which is yeah. often traditionally overlooked in the history books, the local sacrifice, the local suffering. Rachel, tell us first about that decision to move towards the people's history, which I think is a key theme of your exhibition. It's much more of a people's mm -hmm. history than a government's history or a colonial history or a imperial history. And also that extraordinary, poignant exhibit you have about Suk Ching. Yeah, I think we recognize that, um, as you as you said, um, the, the story tends to be from uh, the top-down kind of point of view, but mm. we know that, um, you know, the people who actually experience the fall are all these, like, people who are on the ground um, in air raid shelters or, like, suffering in their homes and such. So we wanted to bring out their stories as well. And also the fact that, you know, people weren't just sitting ducks, but they were also contributing to Singapore's defense, uh, volunteering for civil service and such. So 
we wanted to take the opportunity on this 80th anniversary to also bring out all these stories, which we think are important to contribute in terms of thinking about the fall of Singapore as a collective experience. It's not just one thing that happened to, to one group of people, but something that has affected, um, as Jay also said, many, many different kinds of people. Yeah. Um, and, and just touch from, on that. Uh, sorry, just touch on that Suk Ching element because it's it seems to be for many of the visitors, myself included, such a powerful element of your exhibition. Yeah, definitely. I think even like um, giving tours and such. And the moment you hit that point, no matter how many times you see it, it's it's so emotionally impactful because it's a display of over two hundred um, uh, items that were retrieved from just one burial site um, yeah. of Suk Ching, and it's over two hundred pieces of personal artifacts like watches, belts, keys, and things that people would have been carrying, uh, things that they would have had on them when they were taken away. And I think just the emotional impact of seeing these things that, you know, we carry keys and we wear belts and stuff. And thinking about that and thinking about the way that these people were taken away and, and killed, and these are all that are left of them, is, I think, something that is emotionally poignant no matter how many years have passed. Yeah, Jaya, what comes to mind for you when you think not only of Suk Ching, but as Neil uh, rightly pointed out, the, the impact on the people of Singapore, the civilians, uh, men, women, and children? I, I think it's extremely important that we have a more broad-based story than just Suk Ching. They're not just about Suk Ching, which is extremely mm -hmm. important to tell. Um, you know, in the initial years of our history, the tendency to focus on stereotypes regarding how uh, Singapore should look back on the war. So you have a stereotype image. If it is the Chinese community, it's Suk Ching. If it is the Malay community, it's the Malay regiment. And so, you know, you focus on the Malay regiment. And if it's the Indian community, of all things, you focus on the INA. And that has been the stereotypical way in which, uh, in the initial years, the focus on local history towards the war was. The other, the other aspect was that there was a tendency to focus on the military occupation and yep. so for several years, when you talk about Total Defense Day, kids uh, uh, cook tapioca and taste tapioca to reflect on the years of suffering during the occupation. And in the battle box, what we do is actually focus on the reasons why we were defeated. When you right. talk about the fall of Singapore, it was an amazing uh, military campaign that took place that changed the course of history. Within 70 days, Singapore fell with what was supposed to be an impregnable fortress. And that military story needs to take a little bit more prominence in the national uh, appreciation of the fall of Singapore. I'm all for uh, an appreciation of what the suffering for civilians were, and it, that story must be told. But it must not be the only story that should be shared. It's a much more broader story and a much more complicated story rather than stereotyping uh, the local experience during the war itself. Um, so I'm open for having many different perspectives on the war being shared. And as we go towards the 80th anniversary, I think we are mature as a young, as a nation, to be more inclusive and not only tell the Singaporean story, which should dominate in Singapore, of course, because it's our story, but we should also bring in the British, the Australians, the Indians, who were the largest defense force in Singapore at that point of time, uh, and the locals who fought in the war and recognized the sacrifice mm -hmm. that they made. So in the ceremony that we're holding on the 15th of February at Kranji War Graves, it is a Singapore-led ceremony, but it will include uh, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, India, um, Canada, and even Japan. And, and we bring in Japan because we want to show to the world that in Southeast Asia, uh, commemorations, remembrance of war need not be just a painful thing. They can also yeah. be uh, elements of hope where former combatant nations can come together and work together. Well, that ties in nicely with it. I was just going to mention another book that is out now called In Honor of War Heroes, which is available at all bookstores. And that does just that. It acknowledges all groups, all races, all nationalities who suffered during the fall of Singapore. Which brings it back to you, Rachel. A key point of your exhibit is, of course, the people's history. And it's just what Dr. Jaya said, isn't it? You don't focus on any particular group, race, culture, nationality. I mean, I'm just looking here. You've got Jeffrey Tan's typewriter that he was 15 years, uh, he was 15 years old and he started to record his experiences during the war. I think that's great. You've got Peter Chong's scrapbook 
which contains portrait photographs. You've got uniforms from from uh, from uh, the British and the New Zealand and so on. So it's a very broad based look at the fall of Singapore. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we're cognizant of the fact that, you know, over a dozen countries were involved in the fall of Singapore. And there are all these multinational, transnational histories that we want to acknowledge as well. Uh, not just um, Singaporeans, but also all the other contingents who came here. Um, many of them, you know, the first time they were ever overseas and came here to fight and in this foreign country, like what is their experience as well? So we wanted to acknowledge the fact that there are so many different um, perspectives of the same event. So, for example, the fall of Singapore itself, the surrender, uh, what we've done is we've sort of broken up the surrender table um, as in sort of our installation and um, put in different perspectives of the surrender. So how different people from uh, the generals to the soldiers to the civilians have acknowledged the surrender or how they felt about it so that, you know, you get you're talking about the same event, but you're getting like 20 different perspectives. And that is just a smidgen of what actually people felt and what is still um, sort of going through people's minds today. Fascinating. We're talking with Rachel Eng, the Assistant Curator at the National Museum of Singapore, and Jaya Ayodurai, the Director of the Singapore History Consultants, uh, about the 80th anniversary of the fall of Singapore on February the 12th, 1942, and the new exhibition at the National Museum, Dislocations, Memory and Meaning of the Fall of Singapore, 1942. Rachel, a couple of questions coming in on Facebook Live. Uh, one from Paul Chan. Hi, Rachel. Are there any physical curator or docent public tours uh, at, at the new exhibition? That's the first question. Second question from Pin Chia. Um, she said that there were uh, exhibits of pages of people's diaries written in Chinese, but no translation next to the script. Are those available anywhere to read? So docents and uh, journals, and diaries. Um, for the docent tours, we have a few coming up. I think the the most uh, the closest one is already sold out, unfortunately. But um, there will be definitely tours uh, coming up um, over the course of the exhibition, which runs until May. Um, for the journals, I'm not sure which exhibit um, you're referring to, um, especially. Uh, there was a, there was a couple of questions that one or two things were written in Mandarin uh, from our Mandarin uh, listeners and saying, would there be translations available or, or and things like that. Um, we will definitely have translations available for the text itself. Uh, for the Mandarin, I think, I'm not sure if they're referring to the searching, um, because each of the searching artifacts comes with a tag in Mandarin um, that basically says the date of when it was excavated. So it's, it's more of a contextual thing, but we do reference it in the exhibition text itself so that people aren't like, confused about what's, what it is. Jay, I wanted nice. to ask you, you made a very good point, interesting point about, you know, I studied history myself and when we, the historiography, the history of history uh, becomes more nuanced as we go on. And, and I think traditionally the, the look at fall of Singapore was right. We had the fall of Singapore and then that was the road to self-independence, self-determination, Singapore's independence. But you're, you're suggesting that the Singapore of 1942 to 1945 is a bit more complicated than that, I, I get the impression. It's not so straightforward. A didn't necessarily lead to B. Uh, very much so, in the sense that if you look at the defense itself, there are many issues regarding the defense of Singapore. No one questions why Singapore fell in 70 days. It was the amazing uh, uh, capabilities of the Japanese army in terms of military tactics and strategy and generalship. But as Singapore fell, what was destroyed in that short time was the, uh, the image of not only the impregnability of the fortress of Singapore, but the impregnability of European domination of the region, uh, that an Asian army has so comprehensively defeated a much larger allied army, uh, seemingly a British force. And until today, the impression is it was primarily the British who defended Malaya and Singapore, when it was actually a multinational army. 67,000 Indian troops, 39,000 British, 15,000 Australian, and 16,000 Malayans and Singaporeans were involved yeah. in this conflict. And so it makes it multinational. So the need to spread out and make sure that the world understands that it was a much more complicated story with uh, many nationalities coming together and being part of that defense of Singapore and made that supreme sacrifice. And then when you go into the locals themselves, there were certainly divided loyalties because to a large extent, the Chinese in Singapore at that point, uh, a large percentage of them were Chinese nationals. They were not given citizenships or did not become British subjects. So they were very much involved 
in the war that was going on in China, as Japan invades China, you have the China Relief Fund being set up, you have um, you know, protest marches and demonstrations against Japanese shops, and they were one of the largest communities in Singapore, your average uh, photograph uh, shop and tailor, sorry, and um, um, photograph shop and barber was Japanese, for example. They were all over the place, and they came under continuous attacks from the tensions that were going on between Japan and China, and that was being reflected in Singapore. And that was one of the reasons why the Japanese targeted the significant Chinese community in Malaya and Singapore. So it, it's a broad picture. And when you look at the Indians, it, it's much more diverse. You have those who were neutral, those who were pro-British. And if you look at the 67,000 strong Indian army that fought against the Japanese, only about 11,000 of them joined the Indian National Army. The rest of them stayed loyal and paid a much more heavier price in some ways than mm. the British and Australian POWs because they had refused to join this, uh, or free, this slogan of the Japanese that put Asia for the Asiatics. And the fact that Asians were not joining this army to free India, yeah. uh, those who stayed loyal to, uh, to the British Indian Army, then came under significant amount of reprisals, even executions. Uh, and, and then you had those who were actively in support of the Japanese because it was the route to independence for India in their minds. So it's a much more complicated picture. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the Malays who had been told that, hey, you know, by the Japanese and in their black operations, that the British had come over, taken over your country, and brought all these foreign workers from India and China, and now your country is no more your own country. And therefore, as we take over Malaya, we will give you the government positions. We will make you the, recognized as the indigenous population of Malaya and give you a rightful place. And that eventually leads, in the late 19, uh, in 44, 45, to riots between Indian, Malays, and Chinese because of all the racial tension was brought up because essentially, uh, Force 136 that goes into the jungle and helps set up the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. The Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army was largely Chinese communists. And then you have the local militia being filled with Malays. And so while Britain and Japan were fighting each other, they were using the proxies mm -hmm. of the Chinese communists with Malay militia fighting on the ground. And that's what mm -hmm. leads to the deterioration of the relationship between the Malays and the Chinese after the end of war, and when you talk about going towards a road of independence, the distrust between the communities is basically set by the experience of the Japanese occupation. So all that oh, complexity yeah. has not <laughs> you know, been brought out. And you're, you're just at the tip of the iceberg here. That, uh, you, are, you are right about that. It is a complex and multifaceted story. Thanks for that, Jaya. Uh, we do have to leave it there, but Rachel Eng of the National Museum of Singapore and Jaya Aya Durai of the Singapore History Consultants. Thank you so much. The exhibition at the National Museum, Dislocations, Memory and Meaning of the Fall of Singapore 1942. Of course, the National Museum has got the World War II galleries. Uh, the Changi Chapel and Museum has been recently revamped. Reflections at Bukit Chandu has been recently revamped. Uh, so lots of places where people can go to get the history. But I want to give you a special thanks to both of you for coming on today as Money FM remembers the 80th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. Thank you for remembering. Thank you. Thanks very much.